So I'll just go through some of the practices that Isaacs is proposing for uh, developing respecting, the capacity of respecting, and developing the capacity of voicing. And I think that's all we're going to have time for today. And then next time we're going to look at more at practices for suspending. And uh, that's going to be a big theme uh, next time. Yeah? Next week we don't have class, right? Next week we don't have class, no. I'm pretty sure, right? Next week we don't. Yeah, cool. Good. So the practices that uh, Isaacs proposed for, for respecting. So respecting, Isaacs defines it. Again, respecting is a word where it has a colloquial meaning and Isaacs use the word as a concept in a very specific way. So what he means by respecting is kind of twofold. One is to, uh, he often, like, uh, they often use uh, etymology to explain their concepts. And respect means to look again, right? Respect, spectacles, like, re look again. Uh, and so he talks about how respect has uh, two components. Uh, one of them is the component that the idea that uh, the, the other person is trying to communicate something uh, of importance, something of value. Uh, and this is why I gave you this hint. Think about like the, the people who you disagree with, maybe they're trying to communicate something of value. Uh, and there is it's it's uh, the way he puts it is there is it's possible to have had uh, the kind of life experiences that lead you to have that opinion and so it, it it's possible to have a set of experiences in life so that that particular opinion that they have makes perfect sense uh, that's the first part of respecting the second part of respecting is because you're not them you can never fully understand them. And I think that that brings a little bit of humility in uh, in relationship to to understand. He doesn't say you can never understand other people. He just say there's always like leave a little gap. There might be something you haven't gotten because you you can be empathetic, you can try and be in their shoes, but you haven't lived the life that they have lived. So there's always a possibility that there is something you're not getting right uh, in, in, in how they uh, think about things. I, I think this, this uh, definition of respecting is hugely important. When I was doing my research on uh, leaders and uh, Gordian knots unsolvable problems, then I would often talk to managers about like the, the kind of stakeholders in the organization, could be the employees, could be their boss, could be customers, could be whatever, that they disagreed with or that caused trouble. I would also al always say, why do they do it? And many of them were very certain. They were like, we understand exactly why they do it. And they would always say it's because they're selfish, it's because they're stupid, it's because they don't have the uh, overview of the organization that I do. It's because this, that, the other. So one, they uh, attributed their uh, view to something like a personal flaw. And two, they, they were sure that they knew exactly why they were having the view and that it was a dumb view. And you can see, then there's no point in conversation anymore. Uh, or there's only point in a conversation that, that, it, that only leaves room for you to try and convince the other person of seeing things from your perspective. It doesn't leave room for you to learn anything that you could use in dealing with a problem. And uh, this is not to say that you can't look at somebody's opinion and say that's wrong. Sometimes you're in the position where you, uh, somebody says something to you and go like, yeah, but that's just flat out wrong. But respecting, w with respect, it's like to say, okay, instead of saying, oh, that's annoying and I have to change it, get curious. How is it possible for somebody to believe this thing and put it forward and um, like, how is that possible? That's interesting. That should spark your curiosity. There's something you don't understand because you, most of the leaders, when I say, why you, can you understand why they're holding this? And they go like, no, I can't understand why anybody would be so stupid or so selfish or so whatever. That seems odd. And I think that's exactly it. It seems odd should spark your curiosity. If it seems strange and odd, that means 
there's room for investigation. And this is about respecting, right? So it seems odd to you, so look again. And the practices that, that uh, one practice I think is fantastic, and that's what we just did. So take a view that somebody else has, and then say, if I assume that this other person isn't just crazy, and I should try and argue their point of view. What can I learn from trying to argue that point of view? And as some of you experience, sometimes when you sincerely try to argue somebody's point of view uh, that you dis disagree with, suddenly you say, hang on a sec, I can actually come up with pretty good arguments. And here's the interesting thing. Sometimes you can argue the case better than the other person can do. And I think this is super important. If you are facilitating dialogue, you're a leader, you're facilitating a dialogue, there's a disagreement. And it's almost like um, uh, active listening, but you, up, you, you, you raise the bar. So it's not just that you paraphrase the other person's point of view and say, is that, you know, get it validated. You actually give it an even stronger, more forceful uh, 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 form than the person could do themselves. And this is fantastic. When you do this, you really have them on their side. If you go like, so what you're saying is, and then you give like this succinct, clear, precise, forceful, persuasive argument for their case. And they go like, wow, that's better than what I said. Yes. Right. And, and, and you can learn a lot from trying to do that. So I find that that is, for me, that is a, a super uh, exercise. But let's see what Isaac is talking about. He says, Two of them are, he calls standing at the hub and centering. Sometimes when you are in discussions or in a, a dialogue with somebody, you feel like you're thrown about. It's like a physical sensation almost, like, like you're out of balance, out of center, like you're struggling, right? You're, you're, you're fighting against other people and then, you know, this argument comes in from the left and you go, whoa. When you feel that you're uh, out of balance, that you're not centered, that you're not in the hub, it's usually because you are very identified with one specific opinion in the room. And now you are, you know, fighting from that opinion. So what he says is like, imagine that you're standing in the hub, you know, the, the, the hub and the spokes in a wheel, the, the hub is the center. And, and you can kind of do what we were doing before. So you can, you can still, you have a, a connection to, to the point of view that you normally see things from. But you can also have connections to other points of view and you can see the validity in it and, and you can sort of like put yourself in that position. And this is standing in the hub or, or being centered. And he talks about sometimes you, you can use different uh, practices, whatever gets you centered, whatever gets you like, you know, paying attention to your breathing, take a few breaths or something like that. Wow. To, to, to get yourself centered. It's a very physical experience of just saying, okay, let's just slow down, take a few breaths, and then look at things again. So this is a very nice way of doing it when, when the discussion gets heated. Another thing that he talks about is listen as if it were all me. And this relates very much to what we were doing before. So if you can listen to somebody else and, and, and sort of like, say, I'll imagine that all the opinions in the room is something I can relate to. It's all me. You kind of internalize all the, the um, conflicts because often all the conflicts are internalized. It's just inside. You have all the dilemmas and conflicts, but because you don't like being split against yourself, you have decided on one particular point of view and then you go like, this is mine and the others is not mine. So, the, the, so you can reverse that by including all the perspectives and go like, actually, I can feel this conflict in myself, right? I don't like, uh, say, I don't like the, the, the uh, diversive force that Facebook has and, and exerts on society. But at the same time, I love to be able to connect to people and I don't know what I would do if I couldn't market my products through Facebook, right? So it's like, I love that they have algorithms that's super useful for marketing. And I'm also super disturbed about all the information they have about everybody. And it's an internal conflict. And so 
can you see how before you might be identified with Facebook is bad and somebody else says something else and now we can have a fight? But if you take this view and you internalize it, now you are speaking as if it was all you. And so to give you some examples from, from the world of uh, business, one, I, once I was talking, I think I mentioned this example before, I was talking with a manager who was uh, uh, in a big oil company and she was uh, f f in charge of like analyzing data that comes in from, from different drilling sites. And on the, in, in certain business units that were out there, they, they uh, inflated their uh, findings and say there's tons of oil and we should keep uh, drilling. And she's like, no, you shouldn't. This is never going to give a return on in, uh, investment and so on. When I did this exercise with her, one of the things that she, she found was when she started arguing from, from the business unit perspective, she was like, well, actually, I can see, yes, they're selfish but they're not just selfish. They also have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. They have a lot of optimism. They some of them uh, also really want to do something nice for the local environment. They know that if there's more drilling sites, it's going to create a lot of jobs for the people. And she's like, actually, they stand for all the values that I want to stand for. And in my job role, I stand all for all the kind of values that I don't really like. And that was a huge eye opener for her. And the moment she connected with the people in the business unit and go like, you're wrong, but I, I really admire your entrepreneurial spirit and your optimism and, and all these kind of things, then that opened up the possibility for her to have a dialogue because now she would look at them and she wouldn't just see these annoying people who, who were stupid and selfish. She would see something she could respect and therefore she could have a dialogue with them. And, and it changed the dynamic and she got the drilling shut down. <laughs> but she got it shut down without making an enemy of the business unit. And that is, of course, key because she needs a working relationship with it. And as leaders, you will experience this again and again and again and again. How do you shut an employee's pet project down while retaining a good rapport with that person, right? That's a problem that you as leaders, you'll be in, in that problem over and over again. How do you demote somebody because they have to be demoted and keep a good working relationship with them? How do you cut somebody's budget and keep a good working relationship with them, right? It, it's this kind, because they are gonna push back and some of their arguments are gonna be bad. But yeah, you get the point. I think another thing to, to, to say about when you talk about listening to everything as, as if it's all you, I was recently out uh, doing a, um, a talk on dialogue uh, and it was in an organization that uh, what they were doing is that they would go out into um, elementary schools and talk with parents and children about alcohol consumption and sort of like rules about alcohol consumption and these kind of things. There's tons of research that shows that, you know, if you can postpone the start of uh, drinking alcohol, that's just really good for a lot of things like mentally, physically, whatever. Uh, and, uh, and some parents, they, they are, you know, they put strict boundaries and, and this, and other parents, they go like, Ah, it, you know, I started when I was eight or whatever, right? And it's never hurt me. Mm -hmm. And then these people, they looked at that person and go like, I'm not so sure about that <laughs> statement. <laughs> and so you, you have a problem because on the one hand, they say, no, the science is clear. We know it is harmful. But then you have a person there who says, ah, I don't want to, you know, set boundaries. For, they'll figure it out themselves. I, you know, I trust my children to figure it out themselves. And I don't want to put these clear boundaries. Now, one of the things I find interesting is that you can you, you can listen to them and go like, well, you're just wrong. You should put clear boundaries like this is and you're doing your children a disservice. And of course, they like and our job is to sort of make you put clear boundaries because we know that's better for society as well. But then you can listen to it and say, where is this coming from? What is it that is true and real in their attitude, which may or may not be what they are saying? And when you start listening to it for, from that point of view, you can see like, well, there is actually a problem because uh, one of the things that they said was, oh, look at this person. 
she has parents who are incredibly strict with her and she's the one that drinks the most, right? So why we can't control it anyway. And when you listen to that, you go, ah, so they are bringing out a problem here and they're saying, well, you can put down these strict boundaries, but if that means that the connection to your child is severed and they no longer listen to you, you have a problem. And so what they are, if you listen to them in that way, can you see, you can, you can listen and you can say, well, there's actually, what they're saying might not be factually true, but if you listen deeper, you can understand that it is pointing to something underlying and you go like, and, and when you incorporate that into your viewpoint, you can say, okay, now my viewpoint just expanded. Before my viewpoint was, it's necessary to set clear boundaries. Now my viewpoint is, it's necessary to set clear boundaries in a way that preserves a good relationship to my children. Do you see how? So in that way, uh, when you incorporate uh, things uh, into other viewpoints into, your, your, uh, into yourself, you expand your understanding, even if the viewpoint is expressed in a, in a bad way or not very precise or accurate or even just factually wrong way, it's still, you assume it comes from somewhere and it has value where it comes from. And I need to listen carefully to understand where it comes from. So do you get that? It describes a certain way of listening to other people. And this is what Isaacs mean uh, when he talks about respect. So just quickly, uh, a few more things. Uh, another practice that he talks about is making strange. This is one of my absolute favorite practices. Like we talked about it before, we said when somebody has an opinion you disagree with, don't just collapse it and say, I understand why they have it. It's because they're stupid or selfish or something like that and nothing more to see. Get curious. Make it strange because it is strange. If somebody goes like, you know, uh, drinking alcohol as eight, uh, as eight, I don't think that's harmful. You go like, that's a really interesting viewpoint to have. And it's even more strange because it goes against facts. So how did that happen? How did you get that viewpoint, right? Get curious. If somebody says uh, something in the board meeting where you go like, it's factually wrong, uh, the, the, the organization is definitely going to lose money if we do that. What's this about? That's curious, right? Get curious about it, make it strange. So that is making other people's uh, opinions strange when you don't understand them. Acknowledge your lack of understanding. The most important thing is that you don't understand how anybody could think that. The other thing about making things strange is make your own certainty strange, right? We all have a ton of beliefs that we go like, before, for example, you said if, if people listen to you and they don't give you any feedback, uh, verbally or non-verbally, that's rude, right? And then you go like, that's very interesting. How do I get from a blank face to a feeling that a person is rude? How do I do that? That's strange. What we do most of the times is we go like, well, that's obvious. You know, they're just sitting there with a poker face. That's rude. I mean, that's obvious. There's nothing more to see. But at assuming, well, actually, it's a physiological expression and here's a feeling of rudeness. How do you get from one to the other? That's weird. Make it strange. So I, I, th I find that that is a really good one. Uh, Bertolt Brecht used it a lot in, the, you know, Bertolt Brecht, the, the German playwright who, who did like, um, he did a lot of uh, plays where the, the actors would suddenly like turn to the audience and go like, what do you think about what's happening on the stage? And they go like, what do you mean, right? We're just watching a show, what, that nobody would act like that. So he had all these techniques where he would show something on stage, but then he would make it weird. Why would he make it weird? So that people would think about it. So he would show a, a scene from everyday life that everybody would go like, yeah, that's like that. But then we would use these techniques to make people go like, actually, that's really weird. And so making our own ways of thinking and believing strange, super cool technique. And uh, I know we're a little over time, but I'm, I think they might be waiting out there. I'm just going to say the two last things and then we round off for today. 
So there are two group practices. One of them is uh, to support people who challenge. Right? If somebody is challenging the status quo or the, or the general uh, viewpoint and everybody wants to shut them down, go in and say, no, 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 hang on a sec. What do you want to say? This is interesting. Somebody's opposing, so you're, you're, you're supporting people who challenge us. And the other one he talks about is learning to hold the tension. Uh, so if there's tension in the room, if there's disagreement in the room, we often ask the question, who's right? That's a bad question, often. A much more interesting question is, what are the underlying uh, mechanisms that generate this disagreement? That is a really, how is this disagreement created? That will often give you much more interesting and actionable insights than just saying, who's right? Okay, cool. So um, that was it for listening and respecting this time. And uh, then we are talking more about voicing and suspending next time. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.